My name is uh, Rob Goodwin. I'm the chair of the Development Reboard in Montpelier. I'm going to call this uh, December 6th meeting of Development Reboard to, to order. Um, and I'm going to introduce the members uh, starting on my right. Hello, Catherine Burgess. Oh, oh. microphone. Thanks. Catherine Burgess, Development Review Board. And then we have three people on the Zoom platform. Uh, Joe, are you there? Oh, Joe Kiernan. And Abby. Hi, Abby White. Just two of them on there, I guess. There's four of us this evening. Um, okay. So I will, at this point, turn it over to Meredith, who's going to give an overview of the remote meeting procedures. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be, hold on, let me just check my email real quick. Make sure I didn't have something. Somebody wanted to get in. All right. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, and a lot of this, this part on the screen is for people watching remotely um, over Orca Media who might not have joined the meeting yet and that you but would like to. Um, so they can get in if they need to. Um, so those of you who are watching over Orca Media, if you want to participate in the conversation, you can use this link here. And actually log into the meeting with all of the video options. Um, you can also call into the meeting with this phone number using the meeting ID and be able to you know speak and hear but you won't be able to see things on the screen. Um, if you have problems accessing the meeting please email me at this email address on the bottom of your screen. Um, it, for those attending via zoom turning your video on is optional. Um, and that is one thing that actually you can turn off if you're having connectivity issues. That way you can at least hear what's going on and see what anybody's sharing on their screen. Um, but having to actually stream your own video out sometimes causes problems. For everyone who's attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you are not speaking. This will reduce background noise. Um, anybody who does call in on the phone, you can use star six to mute or unmute if you can't find your mute button on your phone itself. Um, for those on Zoom, please use the chat function only for logistics or troubleshooting issues. Um, those should be directed to me. Um, and, you know, things where you're, you're having a hard time seeing something, something like that, to let us know here in the main room at City Hall how to, how to go about it. Um, and if you have a question or comment about an item on the agenda, please raise your hand, either physically, if we can see you on the video, are using the raise hand button on your toolbar and we will get to you as soon as we can if it seems like we're missing you do feel free to speak up um there's a lot of people to keep track of tonight um and then be partly because we do have so many people to keep track of um you know please remember to wait to speak unless you think you're getting missed um until the chair recognizes you and that's for both the people here in the room as well as people on zoom um, and make sure to provide your full name and address for the um, for the minutes. Um, and this is not a official public hearing. There isn't going to be, um, you know, items entered into evidence, but we still need your name and address to be able to put in the meeting minutes. And that way we can also correspond with you later. Um, in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, um, please note that it will need to be continued to a time and place certain. And I'll get noticed about those issues with access via my email. Okay, so done. go back to that. All right. So, does anyone have any questions related to the remote meeting procedures and the Zoom platform? That. Yeah, I'm All not right. seeing this anybody. Time, I will take a motion to approve the agenda for this evening's meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I was a second from Abby. Is that correct? I didn't hear her. Yep. Uh oh, did we? I think we can't hear them anymore over the speakers now. Hear them. They can hear us, but we can't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear us. Well, and we had Meredith. it working just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Meredith, you can't hear me? I guess not. I don't think so, Abby. Yeah. I can hear you, Abby. 
Okay, oh. now we can hear you, all of you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Alrighty, we have a great, second. Great. We have a second from Abby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alrighty. So um, we'll just go through. Um, Joe, how do you vote? Yes. Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And Rob votes yes. That's four zero. And the motion and agenda is approved. Um, welcome to tonight's meeting. Um, I don't have many comments this evening. I will just put out there that we have an open seat on the uh, development review board. Uh, so if you know of anyone interested, they can contact uh, Meredith. Um, and there is information on the city's website um, also pretty easily accessible for open positions. So uh, anyone interested in joining this uh, board that, you know, only has four people tonight, a um, couple are out for various reasons. It's great having a full board because everyone's got, you know, children to take care of and COVID precautions and jobs and whatnot. It's nice to be able to have a that's maximum uh, size pool to pull from uh, for these meetings. Um, that being said, um, we will now review the minutes from the November 15th uh, meeting. Uh, does anyone have any uh, changes to the minutes? Uh, can we? Yes, we can. Yeah, I believe so. Yep. Yep. Um, I had just one question, Meredith. It seems like maybe just a general note in here to say that parcel two and lot two would be interchangeable. The, the, the plat says lot two, lot two lot subdivision. We're oh. using the notation of parcel parcel two. Yeah. Which we don't, I don't know if we need to change it everywhere, but it's, it's just a. Where did I use lot in here? Well, lot isn't here, but the on the plat, it, in a, the application materials, it refers to a lot maybe it's inconsistent but i was just that's why i was saying not change it everywhere but just put a note about i can yeah. sure i mean that's it's because of in the regs we refer to them all as parcels now oh really so yeah because that's actually the proper more proper term under the regulations versus calling it lots i guess Alrighty. well then so whatever okay <laughs> okay <laughs> um I think that that suggestion is withdrawn. Okay. Um, do I have a uh, motion to approve the minutes for the uh, November 15th meeting? Yep. <clears throat> yes, we move to approve. We have a second. Second. Second by Abby. Joe, how do you vote? Yes. Abby, how do you vote? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And Rob votes yes, that's four zero. And all of those people were at the that meeting. So. Um, okay, we're now gonna move on to our only application of the evening, um, which is uh, for a um, plan review for a campus PUD um, sketch plan. Uh, so we do not need to swear anyone in tonight. Um, this is a more of an informal conversation than an than a application. Um, and uh, I just want to say we're glad to have a lot of public here. This is a really important part in the process to have public comment and engagement because it's at the very beginning. And um, so at this time, I think I'll turn it over to Meredith to do a brief overview of the application um, before uh, hearing from the applicant. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I'm going to stick, try to stick more to procedural. Um, so this is an application for a campus development under Montpelier's planned unit development chapter. Um, and this is this, all the, the planned unit developments have to go through a sketch plan and a final application process. So it's two different applications. Um, the sketch plan hearing isn't really a hearing, it's a meeting where the applicant can get some informal feedback from the board and any members of the public. Um, you know, there will be meeting minutes, but there will be no formal decision from the board. This is not a decision on a permit or an approval of the plan. This is an opportunity for input um, as to what needs to be in the final application. When it before it comes back to the board for an actual decision. Um, 
you know, the, the Vermont College of Fine Arts has had a PUD previously. It was called an academic institution PUD under the regulations that were replaced in 2018. Um, and there's not, there's nothing really physical about actual buildings or parcel sizes or anything that changes between that old one and this one, um, other than, you know, pieces of property that may have been sold in the interim. Um, but there are some, there were some new sort of opportunities that were included within campus PUD options um, in the new regulations, um, including as, as people have seen the, the ability for a campus of any sort, whether it's a college campus or a, a commercial campus to um, be able to get some limited changes in how uses are designated. Um, and what kind of approvals changes and uses require um, and that's that's one of the big you know potential changes under this but a campus PUD isn't actually a permit to make any of those changes it is a sort of a plan a blueprint um, and the college in the future would still need to come back either to the planning department for administrative approval of permit changes or the board if something were to otherwise trigger board review. Um, so, but tonight's just sketch plan when we get to feel things out and a reminder to everybody participating tonight, this is the very first planned unit development that has seen any kind of a hearing since these regulations were adopted in January of 2018. Um, so we're all in the process of learning right now. So thank you very much. Alrighty. Yeah. So, Katie, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, we'll just give you the floor? Sure. Um, my name is Katie Gustafson. Um, I Make sure you're right into the microphone. I currently am the VP of Finance and Administration at Vermont College of Fine Arts. Um, previous to this role, role that I'm in, I was the VP of Campus Planning, and when I moved into that role, pretty quickly um, I discovered that our campus master plan had expired. So this has been on my to-do list for quite some time and there have been a variety of things that have um, just taken my attention in other directions. So I'm really excited to <laughs> be here to have finally gotten it this far and um, I like uh, the board am excited to have the community here to um, give us feedback in terms of what we have presented. Um, I have lived in Montpelier most of my life and um, I feel very strongly about this community and what the college has to offer. So um, I sort of see this as the start of a conversation towards hopefully getting us to uh, the final application process. So I'm sure people have lots of questions, but um, that's really all I'll sort of start out with. So just starting very high level here, what, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why someone would do a, a campus PUD. Like, could you just sort of explain like what your um, goals are and uh, interests are in the, in, the, in the process? Well, like I said, it had ex our campus master plan had expired, the regulations had changed. So in order to sort of get ourselves fully into the new zoning regulations, we needed to submit a campus master plan. So really at this point, the college doesn't have any immediate plans to do anything, mm -hmm. but we are sort of just getting ourselves to the place where we're sort of back in compliance so that if opportunities come along, we're, we're ready to, um, to move forward. So there's no, I mean, it seems like in your, in your, in your application, there were, there's a couple, you know, sort of ideas about the ability to change uses and um, whatnot, which, you know, is not tied to any specific proposal. Um, do you think you could talk a little bit about um, sort of 
what what that process gets you uh, up at the college and then you know in the future. Sure, I mean, so we have a lot of underutilized space. We're a low residency college for those folks that you know aren't that familiar with what we do, which means that of our six programs, they cycle through the campus uh, for a week at a time. Um, every six months. So the six programs are never on campus at the same time. Um, and we use the campus with our academic programs approximately a third of the year. And so that just leaves us with a lot of underutilized space. So um, we have some tenants currently and are always looking for um, ways to maximize the use of the campus. So looking at um, you know, just what we have for excess space and thinking about what are ways we might be able to fill them, whether office space or um, housing, I mean, just all the, the different options that are out there. So we did list many of the conditional uses as things that we could see that could fit there uh, well alongside what we do. Um, and uh again nothing is planned at the moment but when opportunities arise hoping to have ourselves positioned in a sort of efficient effective place where we can move forward with opportunities as they arise mm -hmm. that's rob is uh it's you considering questions i have a follow-up on one of the earlier yep. ones just sure. around context and goals it's somewhere in here um some of the, the language alludes to uh, you know, the potential change needs post COVID or, you know, some sort of, yeah, potential changes in what the students' patterns would be going forward. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, I think that COVID has put us in a position where students haven't been on campus for essentially two years. We've had one group um, in August that sort of threaded the needle before Delta arrived and then we again took another pause so just I think the sort of shuttering of the campus has really um, given up us a moment to to rethink about you know what what might we be able to do long term but again no yeah clear plans about what that might be um, but just knowing that we we do have just so much underutilized space that we we have to be opportunistic with um, opportunities that that come along that are a good fit with what we currently do our students are our top priority the academic programs um, so things that um, like I said office space or um, we have a food service provider that has moved into our um, commercial kitchen which we haven't used in two years um uh just things that will help generate additional revenue to help both bolster our overall um business model so i think you know staying a little bit higher higher level a lot about this process you know obviously it's not, you don't have specific plans so it's not about you know specific things we're more of sort of uh, preparing to embark on a, on a on a process that gives you a more long term process of how you will, are going to, you know, what types of permits you're going to, you know, get and what the process is going to be uh, in the, you know, in, in the future. Um, we've never uh, seen a, you know, PUD application before the board has a lot of discretion on, you know, sort of like what we would require um have you sort of started you know thinking about sort of like what the nuts and bolts um of that application might look like um for an instance the type of site plan you might you know you might need or um sort of the you know, maybe the specific types of uses and um how detailed your maybe master plan you know might be for what the options are in each each building is that something that you sort of contemplated um we haven't yet we're about to start a um strategic planning process so we're in the middle towards the end of our current strategic plan for the college so as we embark on that i think a lot of those ideas will become clearer to us 
Um, again, this in my mind was really just like the groundwork to sort of mm -hmm. number one, make sure we're compliant with what's required currently with the um, zoning in terms of a campus master plan. And, uh, and then as we sort of develop um, what our next five to 10 years is going to look like, um, you know, be able to, to move in that direction. I, you know, I think that some of the conditional uses are things that we're already doing. So in my mind, thinking about moving those things from uh, conditional to permitted make logical sense. We, we lease space to several different offices. So being able to lease additional space to offices makes logical sense. Um, just things that we're already doing so that we don't have to um, go through any hoops to do more of what we're already doing. That's um, good, easy um, space for different kinds of organizations. Um, so, as I recall, I was here. Uh, we had an application. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe it was a year ago now, where you. Um, you got changed the the use of one of the dining halls to be um, more of a commercial commercial kitchen. Um, I don't know if you could maybe talk a little bit about sort of that process and if that's the, maybe the type of thing um, that through this process you're looking to have a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, I mean, so we have a gigantic commercial kitchen. We have students on campus uh, a third of the year. Even when they're on campus, we don't need the entire kitchen to be able to feed our students so being able to have multiple tenants in that space so that it is um, utilized well number one not only provides more revenue to us but it actually in some ways creates a food service model that actually um, somebody's willing to step in to service us a lot of um, you know of the larger food service companies really don't have any interest in servicing us because it is such an up and down model where you've got 45 students on campus twice in April, then you don't have people on campus again until um, the summertime. So we're, you know, there are challenges sort of embedded in our model that being able to, for example, um, have other tenants in our commercial kitchen really benefits us as a college um, and and is actually worked really well for um, right now, it's just one food service provider, but they've been able to do some really innovative things um, with with the space that we have available. So sort of one of those win win situations, things like that, we would love to be able to do uh, more of. And you see a lot of our other similar opportunities, maybe not exactly kitchens because you only have so many, but <laughs> I know on campus, this is sort of, you know, change the use of one building and um, be able to sort of have it multi-purpose and get somebody new in there sort of on the fly. Yeah, I mean, we've been trying to find more tenants for years and it's it's a challenge um, to, to find tenants. So when you do find one that, um, you know, either can help support what we're already doing or use the space in a way that we don't need the space, um, you know, that's, that's really the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the time timeline for getting a administrative permitted use permit is obviously, uh, you know, more conducive to trying to close on a, on a client for a particular use than, uh, you know, coming all the way to the de development review board. And I'm guessing that that's part of this process that you're looking to get into. Absolutely. The more effect efficient that we can be um, will certainly help us when those opportunities arise. Absolutely. Um, so I guess at this point, I just, just still staying a little bit uh, high level here because uh, getting into the details, I sort of like to avoid that until later. Um, so board members, there's a list of conditional uses in the staff report that I believe that the you know BCFA had identified um, as potential um, you know things to put essentially into the permitted use category um, and I just didn't know if any of the board members had any you know sort of major concerns with um, you know sort of for the college moving these conditional uses over to permitted use um, 
Go and ahead. just there. note, I did forget to list office in there. Office. Yeah, I just double checked that and was like, as oh, a, as oh, permit use. Right? No, it's a conditional oh, use. So office personal space. and professional services is permitted, although that's not one that that Katie mentioned in in her list, right? Office use is separate from that and is a conditional use in mixed use residential. So right now, um, VCFA can't add additional square footage of office space, so like a law office, something like that, on their campus without coming to the development review board for a conditional use review. Even you know, even 100 square feet, they can't expand any of those. Um, I just have a question, Rob. Which page are you on in the staff report? Uh, page page eight of the staff report. Um, of the staff that. report. Okay. I'm C at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. yeah, got it. And it continues on to page nine, um, where we have community center, fitness, sports, gym, athletic facility, yeah, building, public safety facility, greenhouse. Um, well, I I do have I do have a question yep. about a lot of those pieces here, and I'm I'm curious about um, how the applicant would manage parking and traffic. Well, I believe that every time we would come with an administrative permit, we would have to provide the shared parking plan, an updated version. So that would, um, I believe, be part of that process. Um, and we have our own parking needs so that, you know, there, there, there are limits to what we can possibly add. Um, in regard to any other things that we might want to um, create as other leasing or rental opportunities. So that has sort of a natural constraint on what we're able to do. Mm -hmm. right. and, I'm, and I'm just the question I, I think I'm wondering about um, you know, all of these conditional uses listed here on page eight and nine, they have varying degrees of impact on, on parking and traffic. And I think some of them would probably, um, would most likely fall out of the, you know, what's, what's attainable with what we have now already. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, certainly don't plan on doing all 15 or so whatever of those things, but if any one of those things came along as a possibility, you know, we'd like to be able to entertain that. And if the parking that we had didn't couldn't accommodate that particular use, we'd have to look at um, adding more parking, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Oh, Joe, do you have any comments? No, not at this time. Um, so I guess one thing to, you know, to consider here is that, you know, there's, there's the element of, you know, sort of moving some of these conditional uses into the permanent use column within the college, you know, PUD, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's some degree of there's particular buildings that you know maybe would you would be interested in applying you know two or three of these uses and particular buildings that say neighborhood market like wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be the or as for an example be the right thing do you think that sort of with your application you could maybe um uh maybe specify a little bit more closely as to what structures you're proposing these uses because i think that you know i can see that it's hard for the board no concern sort of sort of <laughs> be giving a, a blanket uh you know yep. okay for anywhere on campus when obviously you know it's big and there's there's residential neighborhoods and commercial neighborhoods and you know and whatnot and um obviously without the massive plan we can't make that determination uh you know tonight but i think something to consider um you know might be something of that that nature that makes sense yeah, I I think that's possible. Meredith, what were you going to say? So, so sort of like a 
zones of potential development. So like the, right. the, the buildings that might be geared more towards residential versus the ones that might be geared more yeah. towards commercial style, like restaurants or retail, or um, right. like you said, the, the market opportunities, because some buildings or some locations would just be better fits for those than others. Is that what you're looking at? That's correct, yes. Okay. And so I guess what I'm hearing from the board, I'm not hearing a, you know, an absolute no on any of these conditional you know, uses. Um, but, you know, I think that in the final application there, you know, would be need to, a great deal of detail to sort of like making the case for what precautions you have, uh, you know, taken, what infrastructure exists on the, you know, on the campus and, you know, maybe generally like where you would envision that type of use occurring, um, you know, and however that would be best presented. Um, you know, I think is up to up to you, but um, that's the general concept for that um, portion. Anything else, anybody? Because the, the second issue, I think, is is parking. That we, we should dis, we should discuss. We should discuss. I just wanted to sort of close the book on this. Um, you know, general concept of of changes of use because. I think it's kind of twofold. It's the changes of use, and then it's you know sort of the impact, uh, you know, on parking and infrastructure at which that might have. Um, and so, I'm ready to move on to the, the next section of parking if board members are. Yeah, got a nod from Ali. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So, Katie, I, do you you have a sort of a rough sketch master plan of where parking exists on campus? Um, do you think you could just give us a high level summary of <laughs> what your um, what parking looks like in, on the College Hill? Give me a moment to find my Ways down there in the packet. It's right near the end. So on page nine of uh, my campus master plan application, um, I have listed both street and parking lot um, spaces available. So it's on page nine, table A, 224 um, spaces. Um, or what we currently have. So that includes um, a small parking lot behind Dewey, um, a large parking lot that runs behind both Stone and Schulmeyer, and then the um, Alumnix, all the way from Alumnix back to uh, behind uh, Gary Library is the largest parking lot with 99 spaces. And then there, I didn't subtotal the street parking, but there's maybe another, I don't know, 50 spots or so where we own the property on both sides of the street um, that gets us to that total of 224. Okay, so I believe there was a comment from Public Works in the staff report about the street parking. Meredith, did you give um, a summary yeah, on just that? Yeah, just that the the during the winter right now because we have the alternate side parking during the winter the street parking would be roughly cut in half mm -hmm. um, because they can only use one half of this you know each day under the current DPW plan. No, I, don't know which, I don't know which months you typically have students if it's. You know, in the winter months as well, I would assume it would be to be able to fit everybody throughout the year. Yeah, we do have people there in the winter time, and you know, at some point, I would love to have a conversation about that particular um, way in which we're now approaching parking in Montpelier, because that definitely will be a hardship um, for our students when they're on campus. I don't know if now is the appropriate time to have that conversation, but. Um, yeah, that to to lose uh, 25 spots or however many it would be um, would, would be a challenge, I think, at, at certain times of the year. And at the same time, I totally understand why the city is is trying a different approach, because it has been a challenge to keep the streets clean in the wintertime. So 
um, you know, maybe that's we have in the past on occasion asked for a temporary um, uh, permit to be able to have people park on the tennis courts. I don't know if we could entertain something like that or just waving the uh, every other side of the street uh, rule during the winter time. But um, again, maybe not appropriate for today's discussion, but uh, certainly something that we are going to have to try to manage too. So Meredith, we have some flexibility on parking in this process. Um, Correct. Um, you know, there's the board has the ability to waive the minimum parking requirement um, based on several different factors. Um, and, you know, outside of the the special circumstance of the college having not having all of its students on campus all the time, um, there's the the separate allowance for when you have things like um, public transit stops nearby and facilities for um, you know bicycle storage as well as showering facilities for staff so there's some some allowances there where we would just need additional or not we I don't make the decision where the board would need some additional information um, in the final application to to be able to better weigh what kind of waiver it can grant or it's not really a waiver it's sort of an exception it doesn't have to meet the waiver standards could you talk us through what the i mean i think it's pretty clear here the proposal with uh table d the the proposed change shared parking plan you know with the reduced numbers including for the the college can you talk us through you know in the absence of having a formal study right now what types of modes of transport most of your students are using um and that you know is clearly part of the discussion for changes in approach yeah i mean so i i Katie, can't if you could make sure oh, you're close sorry. to the microphone sorry yep no that's okay um so many of our students come from outside the state so they're flying into burlington and they take um, taxis to campus. So certainly not every student is uh, driving to campus or faculty members. And, um, you know, along with that, as I pointed out, um, I believe the college calculation is supposed to be based on number of beds. And we, we, we don't um, generally put our students into the double rooms that have two beds. We have people in single rooms. These are adult students. Um, and we don't, you, we, we're, we're never at maximum capacity. So that, while I understand why that was sort of created as a way to come up with a number of parking spaces, it really um, creates a situation that would require us to have much more parking than I actually think we need. Um, there are very few times when um, we have more than, uh, you know, we have two programs that can get upwards to 150 people. And I'd say maybe half of those people drive to campus. And does the college offer any additional shuttles or anything beyond what's offered in Montpelier? Uh, we don't have any shuttle service. Yeah, okay. So people are taking taxis, um, from the airport or if they are close enough, a lot of them do drive. So a shared shared parking plan here. So if a, a particular building with a parking lot were to come in and ask for a change from permitted use to, you know, to conditional um, use, um, would there still be a certain number of allocated spots for you know the use of that building or what are you talking about sort of you know you have this many you know parking spots in the in the in the PUD uh, and uh, you know they're all communal park, park parking spots essentially I get the distinction that I'm making there oh, I like well, I sort of miss I couldn't hear you I'm sorry okay. so I think so, you were... so like you know um, say uh, college hall you know as a specific parking lot and you're going to change from a permitted use to a, a conditional um use under the conditional use and under the under or under a new pud um would every parking spot in the pud you know um sort of be considered to be used for that you know increase of you know traffic 
you know, what, what it may be, um, or would there be specific spots at College Hall, you know, for that building, because that's where the change of use is taking pay, place, um, you know, designated, you know, and allocated to say that, like, okay, we needed five, now we need you know, 10 because um, a change of use is doubled. And so I, I think it's, maybe that, that doesn't, that's something you have to answer now, but yeah. I think that that's the type of thing, you know, um, you know, going forward that we would need some good information on. Yeah. Um, I mean, currently it depends on the tenant, what, whether we have specific parking spots or not. And I would say the vast majority of our parking spots are not reserved so that we really are sort of just keeping count of how many parking spots we have and um, how many people need spots or how many uses need spots. And it obviously fluctuates quite a bit because it depends on which program is on campus or if no programs are on campus. Right. Checking in with Catherine and Joe here. I mean, Abby and Joe. I'm all set. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, I think these tables are, with the numbers are, are, are good and whatnot, but, um, and I think that what you, you mentioned earlier about, a, you know, a greater conversation about parking, um, and it does seem like with this process, I mean, you know, we've got the ability to be flexible, um, and so, which means you have the ability to sort of get creative and there's a much better plan for parking that works without tallying up spaces in this lot, you know, in this lot and figuring out all the all the uses. I would think that the board is all all ears to a you know sort of a comprehensive plan for you know completely changing it, which the way things are allocated. Um, I think that you know that type of creativity is you know is maybe what this process was intended for. Um, but um, I don't know. We definitely would need some substantiated, you know, evidence. And I think what would be really helpful is, you know, particularly with parking, a site plan kind of showing like configuration of the parking spots where they all, you know, where they all are, and all all the buildings um, that could be used going forward. So say, you know, you go in for a well, a permitted permitted use, which used to be a conditional use, and it makes it much easier and streamlines that process in the planning department to just be able to see like, okay, this. You know, building has X amount of spots and you know, we're good or whatever. Um, so I think that that would be important. Um, sure. I think I'm ready to turn it over to some public comment here. Ms. Meredith, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything. I don't know. Abby, you're not muted. Did you have something, Abby, before we go to public? Um. I, I, I do want to return to the parking question just for a moment, yeah. and I'm on uh, table table C, back to table C. This is just a question for the applicant. So in this, this calculation that you've done, you've estimated 143 spaces with existing college and existing tenants. Um, how do you factor in these additional uses, conditional uses, which you're seeking to have be permanent uses? How do you fact that, factor that into the plan? So where do those spots come in? So tell me again which table you're looking at, table C? Yep, yes. Okay. So the basically with the um, slightly different approach that I proposed in terms of calculating the number of parking spaces we should be required to have. I've uh, calculated 143 places that we need for that, which would leave, um, I think the total is 224, so that there would be some additional parking places available for other uses. All right. Thank you. Okay. You want to start in the room? Or? 
Um, hold on. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to make sure that we get everybody. Why don't we Why don't we start in the room and then go? Um, and we just need to make sure. I know that um, at least one of the people who submitted written comments is here. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if David Frake is here, but we do have their written comments as well. Um, okay. Nope. And Jocelyn just put her hand up. But um, I think we we only have um, you know a little more than a handful of people here in the room, so I think we might go with them first, unless somebody desperately needs to comment before they log off. Um, Joe's Castellano has his hand up and just came up on video. I don't know if he has to log off or something. Maybe just go ahead, Joe. What do you got? Oh, you need to unmute, Joe. Can and you hear me now? I yeah. can. If you can make sure to uh, announce your address, please. Yes, I'm over at 3 Saban Street in Montpelier. So I'm literally right around the corner from the campus. And I have a question for the applicant. And basically, if I'm understanding her application correctly, so she wants to have, be able to do an administrative uh, review as opposed to what the current process is. So this will be comparable to say, um, if somebody wants to build a single family house in a zone, area that's zoned for single family residents, all they have to do is file the application fee and there would be no public hearing, no public notification until a sign uh, shows up. Am I correct? We wanted to consider many of the conditional uses to be permitted uses so that they could be administrative. And we did keep that list really long. But as I said at the very beginning, I feel like this is the start of a conversation. And, um, you know, I could probably be convinced that some of those may need to to come off. So. Um, you know, we have a limited amount of parking available. We have no plans to build anything currently. So there, there are natural limits on what we could potentially add. Um, but if and when the time comes where we have tenants that um, fit nicely in with our other uses, um, we'd like to be able to do that as efficiently as we possibly can. So I don't know if that totally answered your question, Joe. So feel free to follow up if I didn't. It didn't quite answer my question. I certainly would like the college to succeed. And we all, I also realize that the college is definitely underutilized at this point. So we would like to help you succeed in your mission. However, as a neighbor, we would like a little bit more advanced notice. I know that you need to pivot as somebody becomes interested and be able to turn something as quickly as possible, but at the same point, you know, we would like to be notified or at least informed as to what the potential uses and be able to comment if possible. I think that might be a me question, really, because yeah, go ahead, Marta. This question. Yeah. Um, so, Joe, I mean, the what the request is from the college for those changes to how those uses are designated, essentially, yes, it, it switches anything that the board approves in the final application right to be counted as a permitted use moving forward um, it would require just a permit from our office as long as nothing else triggered development review board review um, it, it would be the standard you know in office permit with the 15 day appeal period with the blue notice card going up in public view on the college campus um, related to the parcel on which that change has taken place. Um, so there wouldn't be individual abutter mailed notices. There would not be a public hearing, like I said, unless something else triggers that um, public hearing. So um, if all the college is doing is converting interior space of an existing building to a different use that in this PUD process has been converted to a permitted use is no longer conditional. There's no, no big new buildings. There's no request um, for parking spaces beyond what's approved in the master plan. Um, you know, there's no other things that don't quite fit with the master plan that's approved under the PUD. 
then it would just be an administrative permit, like you said, um, similar to what what would happen with a a building a single family home. Um, you know, if if there are if there are changes to the outside, even just lighting changes to accommodate the new use, it's going to trigger site plan review, um, even in house site plan review, which does have us look at landscaping and screening and things like that. Um, we do some of those things in in the office without it going to the board. So it can sometimes be a little higher tier review than a house, but the notice to neighbors would not be anything more. Hope that answered the question. Thank you. Yes, it did. Okay, we this, this time we'll take our first uh, citizen for public comment uh, that's here in the room. Anyone like to speak? Go ahead. You could just Hi. state your state yep. your name and address just yep. to make it easier. Okay, I'm Paul Pernahan. I live at 14 Saban Street, and uh, I was just going to say that um, I was pleased to hear the chair say that it would be helpful to have more of a plan as to what's going where on the campus. I think, uh, like Joe said, everyone uh, wants to see the campus succeed. Um, but it is a little daunting to see that huge long list of uh, conditional uses being moved over into permitted uses without really a, um, a set plan of how that conversion is going to take place or where it's going to take place. Um, so, and I can see how some, um, you know, some uses might, uh, might work out well, but then another opportunity comes along and if it's permitted, um, it's been moved into permitted, maybe the campus can't support all those five things that the, uh, the college wants to do. Um, so it seems that it would be um, useful to know what buildings are designated for what sorts of uses, uh, and that would be more of a, a plan um, so that the community uh, can know what's what's going on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Nice. There's no one else in the room. Anyone? Let's so move to our next. Person on the Zoom platform, Meredith. Yeah, we have? so I am going to be going in order of what I have in my participants list on the right with hands raised. So we have Phyllis Rubenstein. Please unmute and give us your address, please, and then make your comment. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this meeting tonight. I'm Phyllis Rubenstein at 15 College Street. I live closer to the college than both Joe Castellano and Paul Carnahan. I've lived in this house since October of 1999, I believe. And um, I certainly recall the times when the dining room at Vermont College was open to the public. I don't know if that's the case. I was, I, I don't know um, anything about the current use of the kitchen facility. I do know that there was a cafe that's not in the former large kitchen dining room. There was a cafe that was run for a period of time. I would um, echo what Joe and Paul both said. I'm very concerned about the number of permitted use possibilities on that list. Now, if anyone knows where 15 College Street is, I, I'm a directly across the street from Michael Sherman. I'm on the east side of College Street, which is the only side of College Street in, uh, from um, on Lower College where you can park. So below the college, you can't park on both sides of the street. You can't park on Michael Sherman's side. You can only park on mine. And if you look at my side of the street, right in front of my walkway, I don't, there's no sidewalk uh, from College Street, on College Street from um, Barry all the way up to, uh, the college. And, um, but I do have a walkway that leads from my front and back door to the street. And going to the issue of parking, um, there is now a, there has been a sign in front of my walkway. So it's not the sidewalk, it's the walkway from my doors, my access to the street. There's a sign that says no parking in front of the walkway. And I had to ask Mont Montpelier to put up that sign because Vermont College students 
when um, in, in the periods of time where there were residencies, people not only parked in front of my house, but they parked in front of my walkway. So I'm very concerned about parking. I'm very concerned about the types of businesses that might come in that could attract uh, a lot of vehicular traffic. And, and, and I, I don't know that there is a legitimate reason to change from conditional use to permitted use for all of these activities because it's actually denying the neighbors a sort of due process right to be heard in this process. If it just becomes an administrative process, we really lose our voice. And I, for one, am concerned about changes to the neighborhood that could happen with some of the types of businesses listed in the application. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, okay, next I have Jocelyn Wolczek. You have to unmute. My, I'm here and so is my husband, Anthony Irapino, and he's gonna speak first and then I'll give my comment second. So I'm just gonna turn the screen so you could see him. Okay. Hi there, uh, whoops. We're at Four Saban Street, also uh, around this, around the corner from the college. Um, walk through the college campus every day, uh, and we also run a small law firm in downtown Montpelier, representing a lot of uh, businesses in the downtown. I have to say, I'm very concerned for the future of Montpelier. We have obtained a reputation as a no-growth town. Um, singled out in an April uh, 2021 art, uh, article of seven days as such. Um, and I'm worried about the vitality of some of our institutions in town, like the college, like um, National Life. They're large employers and they're large landowners. And if they go away, they will be hard to replace. Um, I have been doing a lot of study uh, and work through the Vermont Bar Association I uh, co-hosted uh, with Vermont Legal Aid Attorneys um, a, a continuing education course on the role of land use planning laws and, 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 and structural racism in the United States and how um, abusive regulatory process to uh, essentially prevent things like increases in density in urban areas and neighborhoods has um, had a negative impact on the vitality of communities, on the diversity of communities. We know that there's a housing shortage in Vermont right now, and that we don't have a lot of new construction in Montpelier. We've got a large campus sitting there going underutilized. And I think something like the planned unit development that's being proposed, subject to the reasonable um, specifications that other folks have mentioned, uh, makes a lot of sense, but I hope that as the DRB goes through this process, you'll take some time to educate yourself on the historical role that land use regulation um, has played in cementing um, inequity in our society and in preventing Vermont and communities like Montpelier from being more diverse from a demographic standpoint and a socioeconomic standpoint. And we know that unfortunately a legacy of structural racism in the United States also is that socioeconomic diversity and racial diversity are closely linked. So I know there's a long process ahead, but I, I, I hope that the DRB and our neighbors will um, take the time to be educated about the extent to which Montpelier has developed a reputation in the state of Vermont as being ground zero in our affordability crisis, in our lack of diversity crisis, um, because it's just seen as a town that is resistant to change, resistant to density, and resistant to any kind of um, progress that would make the barriers to entry in this community uh, lower so that we can have a more diverse, sustainable population over time. Hi, uh, Jocelyn Wilczek, Four Saving Street. Um... 
Thank you, by the way, to all the volunteers on the DRV. I know this is an unpaid job and it takes a lot of time. And I know this is a preliminary meeting, but um, I wanted to share some thoughts with you at the outset along the lines that Anthony set out. Um, I've reviewed the school's application and I fully support uh, most of the conditional uses being treated as permitted uses for a number of reasons. I also fully support the five parcels being treated as one unit because functionally speaking, they act as one. And I think it reflects the on the ground realities. Um, so a couple of my reasons for the DRB approving these conditional uses as permitted uses is our city suffers from aggressive nimbyism. It has made our city anemic in terms of diversity and inclusion and growth. I understand people want their neighborhoods to look the same and not change, but that is completely contrary to the city's goals of diversity and inclusion. It's also contrary to the city's goals, which this, this project, this campus creates an amazing opportunity to bring in more housing which also meets the goals of helping to bring in younger people in our community. Another great goal that this PUD can help, um, as someone who works in the regulated entity every day, the regulatory, regulatory environment, the less regulatory hurdles we can place on the school, the better. Absolutely, they need to submit a plan. But no one has a due process right to review a private property's um, plans here. And I think the lower regulatory burdens we can place on the school, it's better for um, the school to engage developers who may want to turn these units into apartments. Um, and that is a, a, a goal um, that I hope the DRB has in mind. A couple other points. Our city's in desperate need for employees to help support our downtown businesses. And if we can help recruit employees by saying, hey, look, we've got all of these apartments or even short-term rentals within walking distance of our restaurants, our hotels, our businesses, we as a city will be more competitive. Um, two other points, the school has been a great neighbor no one is entitled to use that property. They open up their property for picnics, family gatherings. Um, and I think we as neighbors need to um, support the ultimate flexibility for the school to um, financially be able to hold on to these real estate, um, to, these, to these various parcels. And um, the last point I'll make is there are not, many properties in Montpelier that create the, that have these awesome opportunities. And so I encourage the DRB to limit the regulatory burdens this school needs to meet. And um, to also think about this school as an opportunity to reduce admissions because if it is a hotel or short-term rentals or apartment, it is, it is within walking distance um, of the downtown. So thank you for your time. We may not be able to attend all, the, all these meetings, so we wanted to provide these broader comments uh, earlier on in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank if you. you could make sure to put your hand down. Uh, Jose, you would be next. Thank you. I'm Jose Aguayo. I live at One Kemp, and which is right across from uh, Schulmeyer Hall. And um, uh, I wanted to address something that was just, there was a couple of comments that were just made. Uh, that to me, the college is, is um, this is just a discussion we're having about the college. Just, this seemed like some sort of libertarian political discussion we were having earlier about regulatory uh, constraints. So I think we should try to avoid that. Um, and then the diversity from actually, I'll mention that I'm from Mexico originally, and I, uh, I know of a number of people moved in. It's very expensive to live here. It's difficult to move into town. But there has been a growth, actually, in the number of people. But, you know, there are a lot of constraints, as we all know. I wanted to point out that the mission of the college, as stated by them in the past, has been the mission of, as a national center for education and the arts, which is really to the core of what their purpose is. 
At the time when the college was acquired, they also acquired, I believe, 11 leases. You know, there's at the time, um, I believe in uh, 2013, 2014, 62%. And this is coming from uh, the Supreme Court decision, the opinion, when the city and the college went to the Supreme Court because the college felt that they were exempt of paying property taxes on the building that's across the street from me. And they said they're 11, they had 28, $2.8 million in revenue. I think we need to know, as, as neighbors, we would love to know what the situation of the college is. You know, where are they at? Are we facing, you know, are they facing, a, are, they, are they gonna have a, a financial crisis soon? Are, are there more leases? Are they doing okay? Is this something that they, they're, that's gonna force them into anything that presents itself? I think we need to have a definition of what, yeah, uh, what was suggested earlier, what each building, what proposal there is for each building in terms of moving, if they're planning to move from uh, conditional to permanent use. Uh, I live across the street from the parking lot in Schumacher, and I can tell you that there's all this traffic from delivery trucks back and forth, back and forth all day long. You know, how many more would there be? You know, that's a good, that's a question to have. If you're going to move more businesses, you're going to lease most more of the space that's there and um and also you know just uh it, it, i think we we are looking at a college that actually has some has had some great graduates authors writers um in the field of communications so they need to communicate with the neighbors what exactly it is that they plan to do in order for us to feel more comfortable as neighbors you know on, on, on what they what, what they want to do we want them to succeed but we don't want to be um you know, forced to accept anything they want to do at their whim. They're an educational institution. They're not here to set policy on zoning in the city of Montpelier. So, you know, I, I really would like uh, a lot more definition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jose, if, when you get a chance, if you could make sure to put your hand down. Uh, and then Alvira, Dana, you would be next. Hello, can you see and hear me? I can. Great. Uh, so I'm at 29 Ridge Street. So we actually share the fence with the parking lot at Dewey Hall. And we are relatively new neighbors to the um, to the university having moved here just in the very end of 2019. But I wanted to say that we're very happy to be neighbors with the college um, because we really enjoy the resources that the college so generously allows the neighborhood to use. The kids play you know, pretty much every day, sometimes twice a day on the green. Um, I'm never sure how the college manages to keep up with the, um, the quantity of dog waste deposited in there. <laughs> <laughs> their trash bins, but they really do so um, with a kind spirit. And boy, there are a lot of dogs, including ours. Um, <laughs> so we're really appreciative of the services that they offer to the community. Um, and although we're relatively new neighbors, I grew up in Vermont. My mother went to Vermont College. I worked at Norwich during the period when the college was had been acquired by TUI and I provided some service to students then. So obviously the campus has changed over time. The university has changed the purposes, the various you know, strategies to, to keep the institution afloat as it's changed over time. Um, have have changed, and I think it's great. Um, so we we have watched the increase in delivery trucks and so forth um, through the the loaning bay in Dewey Hall, and it's actually less noisy and disruptive than standard you know trash service picking up trash cans. Um, everybody's very courteous, um, just as promised. Um, there's been a real limit on anybody smoking or loitering in the parking lot. So um, I would say the college has been very reliable in delivering on its pledge to um, make use of the facilities that it has, but in, in deference to neighbors. So we've been pleased with that. And uh, I would generally just say that one thing that I love about Vermont and the reason we moved back after having lived overseas for, for almost a decade is the resourcefulness of Vermonters. And what I see in the proposed plan is that very resourceful nature to make use of what is there in a way that furthers the future of the college, um, but also continues to make the neighborhood hopefully more vibrant. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for more vibrancy and more activity. Um, so I look forward to seeing what, what, will, what the future holds. 
Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next we have Shana Casper. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yep, my name is yep, Shana Casper. Can. Yeah, I live at 21 Ken Street. I've lived in Montpelier for about seven years. And thanks to my parents' really substantial help in supporting me and buying this home, I've been here on Kent Street for about four years. And I moved to Montpelier because I want to, I, I work remotely and I, I was able to like really choose where I wanted to live. And I wanted to live in a vibrant and diverse community near my family. I wanted to be able to like walk to the grocery store to walk to my friend's house, the movie theater, to the woods. And I really, you know, won. I got it all by, by living here on Kent Street. Um, and the really the one problem is that living in Montpelier is extremely expensive. And every year, you know, year after year, of the seven years that I've lived here, I've had friends and loved ones who just can't afford to buy, who can't afford to continue renting, who can't afford to stay here, or they find that the city isn't as welcoming as they'd like it to be. And I would not have been able to afford to live in this community without my parents' help and to be able to live with roommates. And it's a really expensive place to live and structurally cuts out young people and people without class privilege, people of different class and racial backgrounds, people with disabilities and more. And you know, these are some of the reasons why I joined and I'm now the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, although I want to make it really clear here that I'm speaking as an individual, not as a member of the community. Um, I didn't even know about this the last time we had our call. Um, I also recently just got a very energetic COVID dog named Roxy, who I'm now taking out in for you know three or four walks a day. And yes, you know, three or four bags of that poo in the college green trash cans. And see you out there in like 20 minutes when this call gets done because she's like pacing around me right now. Um, but, and these walks are not like they were when I lived downtown. You know, I've been walking past all of this empty spaces and all these really incredible buildings um, around the college. And I love it when the college like is in session, when there's like music coming out of the windows and people gathering on the green. And I've been daydreaming as I've been walking and listening to my podcasts and such about what these spaces could be to like keep my friends and my loved ones and my neighbors here, um, keep them as my neighbors. And so when I got the flyer on my door from my neighbor, Erin, you know, who I'm in a book club with and like who we have this neighborly relationship with, letting me know about this meeting, I was just so thrilled. I'm so excited to be able to move forward to develop this space, to be able to have more young people, people with different backgrounds, different businesses, to be able to recruit and retain more amazing folks to this neighborhood. Um, I'm just really excited to participate in this process moving forward. So thanks for starting it. Thank you, Shana. All right, next we have Donna Ackerman. Hi, everyone. I'm Donna Ackerman. Um, my house is at 10 Kemp Ave, and I am a direct abutter to the college. And I have been, get this, for 43 years, a direct abutter to the college. And um, I've seen many, many changes. Um, also, I have spent my professional life the past 36 years working in affordable housing. I'm trying not to take offense at some of the comments that were made because I honestly don't feel that moving, that, that keeping the conditional uses in the conditional use department basically has anything to do with racism or being more restrictive or trying to um, keep a certain population away from my property. I just know that for the, honestly, for the past 43 years, as the college has changed from Norwich, from Vermont College with women only to Norwich and all those things over the years, things have come up regularly that have presented possible changes in the campus use. And always I've had the opportunity to share my opinion, sometimes listened to, sometimes not. But I feel like if I were gonna make changes to my property, there's a process that's rather restrictive in Montpelier for me to go through, and I appreciate that. I would expect the college um, to do the same. And I, I feel like it just, 
although it is private property and I don't have the right to tell them what to do, part of the, the process has to do with the character of the neighborhood as written in the, the guidelines. And that's really something I think we all should have a voice in. And I'm more than willing to work with the college on anything they present, but I don't want any of the current sort of, I guess restrictions is the bad word as a bad word to use, but I don't want any of the current um, conditional uses to be made permitted uses because it takes away the pro the due process basically and the discussions. So I echo what Jose says and Paul says, and, and some of us live closer than others, but I see the college out my back door and I'm happy they're there. They're good neighbors and I, I wanna keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next would be Mike Donofrio, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Yep, and Donna. Good. Okay, great. Uh, Mike D'Onofrio at 88 College Street. I, I just wanted to let you know that um, Elisa Dworsky has been like literally raising her hand for a long time. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's if, I was going in my participants list on the right hand side because I've got multiple screens of people, so I couldn't. Yeah, Elisa okay. doesn't have the hand function on her. Um, okay. Zoom, we learned right. earlier. So we'll, so we'll get to you next, Lisa, okay? I was gonna say, I'd be happy to let Elisa go ahead of me or, or whatever. Which, um, however you two wanna work it out is fine. Go ahead, Elisa. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. My yep. hand was getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I live, I'm Elisa Dworsky. I live with my husband, Daniel Sagan at 31 First Avenue. We're right next door to Dewey Hall. We've been here Oh my goodness, my youngest daughter, I was pregnant with her. She's 18 now, so 18 years. And um, I did submit some comments in a letter uh, to the committee earlier today. Um, look, I want Vermont College to, uh, of course, succeed. And um, I should mention that I'm an architectural designer. I have a master's of architecture. My husband is a registered architect. We have a design firm. We've been practicing design in Vermont for, gosh, nearly 30 years. And, um, you know, details really matter in terms of understanding impact of design decisions. And I include in that use decisions. And um, I agree with so many of the people who've spoken before, uh, Phyllis and uh, Donna most recently, that it's incredibly important that we as community members have an opportunity to have our voices uh, heard, to have a chance to understand, ask questions and review any changes to the use of buildings on the campus. In a way, it's a little bit like a variance because those changes are changes from the current educational use. And just as at a domestic scale, we would have an opportunity to comment on our neighbors' variances. I believe we really should have the right to comment on this neighbor's variances in use. And that isn't to say that I am necessarily opposed to some of these conditional uses at all, but I think we should also, nobody has really listed them for the record in, in this uh, discussion. I know it's in the, the uh, you know, in the documents, but let's just, I wanna take a moment to read them. Multi-unit dwellings, five or more units, group home, congregate living, temporary housing, hotel or motel, neighborhood market, open market or market shop, retail sales, restaurant, including takeout, food service contractor, surface parking, performance theater, movie theater, community center, fitness, sports, gym, or athletic facility, medical clinic building, public safety facility, and greenhouse. And I think office was mentioned. Yeah, in the office, as well. office, that was a mistake on my part. Yeah. Right. Um, so I know as, you know, as a resident next to Dewey Hall, which I know is being underutilized and it's not my intention as a neighbor in any way to keep it underutilized, but to change it from a dormitory to any one of those uses might have a significant impact on um, my experience as a neighbor, my fellow neighbors, parking on the street, 
uh, traffic noise levels. And I think that I should have the right and my community should have the right to make comments on that change. And if we can, if we change these conditional uses to permitted uses and the language is a little, you know, the way that it was put into this uh, document was not straightforward, let's say. Um, I don't appreciate that, frankly. I wish that it had been more straightforwardly stated. Um, but, you know, that's a significant change that I really oppose. And um, that isn't to say I oppose any one of those uses in particular, but I want to retain my rights for comment and feedback and to raise issues as they affect me and my neighbors. And I do have a question because um, this is a lot of this is referenced under, I guess it's confusing with the pages, page seven of the staff comments, page 12 of the PDF under item G, any use permitted or conditional allowed in the base zoning district that is also listed in the campus master plan as incidental to or supportive of the campus's primary purpose shall be allowed in a campus development as permitted use. That I think I understand um, and was clarified, which is basically effectively everything in the conditional use would become permitted use and we would lose those rights as community members to comment, to give feedback and for a discussion to take place, it would automatically be approved and we would nothing we could do. Um, on item two, I'd like clarification. The board may approve additional uses listed in the cap campus master plan that are not otherwise allowed at all in the base zoning district. So long as the applicant obtains conditional use approval and demonstrates that the proposed use is incidental to or supportive of the principal purposes of the campus development. So does that mean that without community input, additional um, conditional uses, which effectively would be permitted uses can be added without community feedback? Can I just Go respond ahead, to that? Right. So I'm gonna to respond to two parts. I'm gonna to respond to your question, but first I'm gonna to respond to a comment you made. Sure. Just a reminder, that an administrative approval is not a, you're definitely going to get your permit no matter what, they still have to meet standards. Um, it does mean that there's not a public hearing, but we really carefully go through every single administrative permit application. Um, On to your question, um, the way I interpret that point two under section 3406E is that if something that would otherwise not be allowed in the mixed use residential neighborhood so that includes the communication tower which is the one thing in that category that is in the draft sketch master plan um to get a permit to actually put that up should that that use remain in the approved master plan right through the final application process that would require conditional use approval as the final permit to actually get built, right? So the, the tonight we're in sketch plan. We're then gonna have to go to the final application for this PUD, right? This campus PUD. Um, at that point, the board is gonna say which permitted, conditional, or not allowed uses can continue to be listed in the master plan, right? basically going to be strike through or specific caveats for those different uses when we get to the end of this process. Then the college has to come back for, for permits. So if there's something that ends up in that master plan that's eventually approved under the final application process for the PUD that would normally be not allowed in mixed use residential at all, that will then become a conditional use on the campus. That's so that would require the, the full conditional use review before the DRB with traffic character of the neighborhood, you know, other impacts. But it's, how is it, I mean, you're, you're saying before that, that all conditional uses become permitted uses. So I'm still right, right, right. Things that are in the use table in the zoning regulations, there are permitted uses, conditional uses, and things that are not allowed at all in a zoning district. <laughs> Through this campus master plan process, the board can authorize for just the campus to shift where those what those labels are mm -hmm. right so things that are currently listed as conditional use can be moved to permitted things that are currently listed as not allowed at all can be moved to conditional use 
This means you can't move something that's not allowed at all to permitted. Can't do that. The board is not authorized to do that. They're only authorized to move uses one step. And we can talk about this more offline if you need to. Um, no, I think I understand what you say. And what you're okay. saying is that anything that is not listed as conditional use currently and would be added would be subject effectively. No, not anything, not anything. Only the things that, 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 were approved, that approved. the campus specifically puts in the master plan and the board agrees is in right. the master plan. It still has to be listed in the master plan specifically as one of those uses that goes towards its primary, I don't know what the exact language is, uh, incidental to or supportive of the principal purpose of the campus and the board approves it in the master plan slash campus PUD process as being in that category. Okay. One of the things I want to sort of um, return to is this, 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 you did make that distinction that you as a, as, as a board would be reviewing uh, these administrative applications. No, no, not the board. I'm not a member of the board. I'm staff. I'm right. the planning and zoning administrator. Mm -hmm. So I, I and my zoning assistant look through any administrative application. That's okay. me speaking as the planning and zoning assistant. Um, and that's why I'm answering this question because the board doesn't, the board doesn't handle the winnowing of which applications go where. You will be right. So you and your staff would be reviewing those applications and there would not be community hearings for anything that is currently Correct. traditional. And I am saying that while I understand that Katie is concerned about efficiency, there's also, and I'm in no way trying to suggest nimbyism, but I think there's an in-between, which is, you know, a realist, a realistic uh, front in which, you know, community members get to have a voice and, and the process gives them time to be informed and to weigh in. And that that's really important in terms of community relations also with the college. I mean, I think it benefits them to engage the community around these changes and these relationships. It builds stronger relationships for everyone. Um, the other thing that I noticed uh, that is, forgive me, it's gonna take me a moment to scroll through this PDF. Um, in her comments, oh boy, where is this? Yes, back on page five or 29 out of 45 of the PDF, uh, I think it's Katie or her team, talk about a particular interest or elements that would fit naturally with the primary function of the academic institution and the needs of the community and include, and I think they're talking about what, what would be activated, any housing options, uh, one to four family dwelling units, senior housing, multifamily units, group home, congregate living and temporary housing, uh, bed and breakfast, inns, hotel, motel. Um, but I also noticed surface parking to convert the, the former tennis courts into additional off-street parking. This has come up before in the community. Um, I'm not personally opposed to using that surface in part for parking, but again, design really matters. You know, is there screening with trees? Is the basketball court uh, preserved? Because I know while it's private land and it's, of course it's been very generous to let kids use it, it is really part of the culture of our place now that kids go there and play basketball. So what is it gonna mean uh, to potentially turn that surface, which they're talking about doing through this process into a full parking lot? And again, I feel like, you know, show us the design, let us as a community weigh in, but just giving sort of a process where that just goes to the zoning board without our comment for something like that, I don't think that makes sense. Um, and um, so I wanted to note that for the community that that's also up for discussion and part of what the college is, is talking about changing. And as for me, if for example, Dewey Hall turned into a motel, it's not that I'm necessarily opposed to that, but I would like an opportunity to ask questions, understand more what the nature of that is. And I don't agree that just because changes are made to interior areas and not exterior surfaces that it doesn't have an impact on the community in terms of patterns of use, traffic, pedestrian traffic, et cetera. I just really do not agree with that statement at all. Um, okay, I think I've sort of highlighted areas of concern and I thank you for your time and I appreciate your time tonight, thanks. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, Mike, because you put your hand down, did you actually have another comment on your own since you were 
up yes. there before others. Okay. Thanks. Um, really quick, uh, I want to echo primarily the comments that um, Shana Casper and Elvira Dana made. Um, I, I support uh, the application um, largely for the reasons they articulated um, in terms of, you know, being open and flexible to change that's going to um, over time enhance the the prosperity and kind of equity and diversity of our community. Um, I also want to echo Shana's comment of thanks um, to our neighbors who kind of got the word out and stuffed um, flyers and mailboxes and, uh, you know, alerted me to this event that I otherwise would have missed. Um, and I intend to stay um, involved with the process and, you know, kind of see where this goes and continue to weigh in. Um, that's all I want to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, okay, James, you would be next in the list of hands. Hello, thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank you for the to the review board. Uh, big thanks to Katie for showing up representing the college. Um, and thanks to the college. I, I Sorry, James Ray, I live at 76 College Street. Um, and so just down near Marvin in college. Uh, and like everyone else, a huge thanks to the college and, and what a gem it represents to the neighborhood. Um, two just really sort of kind of questions and comments, not really for answer now, but just to log, I guess. Um, one may sound a little out there, but in my imagination of what I don't know, it could would be has to do with traffic and speed on College Street. Um, it's designated as 25 miles per hour now. Anyone who spends any time here on College Street knows that far too many drivers don't obey that speed limit. Speed limit, and I, I and that's not the college's problem to be sure, sure. But I just I my question down the road is if if uses change and more people are brought there, is there any trigger that that would amp up enforcement of the of the speeding speed laws on College Street in, in conjunction with that? Layered on that, and again, this is my really sort of hypothetical, could this happen? Are there any uses, change uses along the College Street buildings of the college that could trigger College Street being redesignated at a different speed limit? And I just want to go on record saying I strongly oppose that <laughs> because it's way too fast as it is. So I, I just I want to raise those as questions um, from a person who doesn't really know what he's talking about, but who is a homeowner here and concerned about the speeds that already happen. Um, the other thing I will say, and again, if I'm if I'm unless I'm and please correct me if I'm completely misunderstanding this, but from what I heard at the beginning that this the PUD laws as we're talking about here from Montpelier are relatively new <clears throat> on the books. And based on an experience we had with the city a couple of years ago, um, I would just hope that the city proceeds with some sort of, um, not caught, just, I guess, caution or um, uh, basically we, we were working with the city on some stuff right, right on the heels of the change to the, what you could build on the grade, the slope gradients. Um, and this, I will say everyone in the city was so generous and so wonderful with their time and incredibly helpful, but the change led to a ton of confusion and a lot of people not really knowing what the right answer was. And that made the whole process very confusing and frankly more expensive and a lot of other things. And I'm just imagining that if the PUD laws are that fresh and new, this is a big project to be putting into a brand new system of laws. And I'm not saying don't do it. I've, I'm echoing like, I, it's more just, I hope the city, um, it's a big one to test those laws with, I'll put it that way. And to me, that suggests some measure of caution in terms of how it how things proceed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, James. Uh, so next, I have Aaron Aguayo. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for doing this, and thanks to the college for all they do to keep things vibrant and interesting, and I hope the students are back soon. Um, 
I live with Jose at One Kemp Avenue, which is Kemp and College Street. So most of our property is adjacent to VCFA, kind of the back end. And um, I'm, I'm really surprised at how long the list is of conditional things that might turn administrative like an office I don't think anyone here would notice if they rented out 20 or even 40 offices for quiet daytime use even with the traffic but when you add in like I'm especially concerned about the group and transitional homes like I know the college was talking with Good Samaritan Haven last year about possibly putting in a pretty significant, um, I mean, a group home or transitional or homeless shelter. And it was something they were discussing. And I can understand that having empty buildings, that would be something you would think about and talk about. But I am not comfortable with my next, and it is my front yard, but someone in my front yard making that decision without any public comment would be a significant change in the neighborhood dynamic. And I'd be concerned about it. Like we had one drug dealer on our street who would deal drugs out of the college parking lot. And it was so hard to get that under control. And it doesn't take a lot of uh, un unmonitored activity at the college to really have an impact on at least our experience of our neighborhood in Montpelier. And I understand if the community decides they want to add transitional housing and group homes, that's, but it's, it should be a community decision that the college is a small group of academics who run a private, relatively elite institution for people seeking master's degrees. And they don't have the experience to do this without community input or real supervision. And it makes me very nervous to have set up our lives here and really try to participate and contribute and know that at any moment the college could decide to put in restaurants or movie theaters or hotels or thing you know just and I'm not worried about someone calling it NIMBY like this is my, where we live and it's it really does affect our experience of our lives every day and at night and um, I, I would just hope that that list of conditional issues is made smaller maybe you know there's plenty of things where it would contribute so much to the community or you wouldn't notice or it's not going to change the neighborhood but some of the things on that list are really significant changes and I, I feel like the list could be smaller to be turned into administrative approval so the college could be more nimble about accepting leases for appropriate tenants but if you're talking about bringing you know bringing dozens or even hundreds of new people to live on College Street, it would be good for the neighbors to at least know that that's in the in process and ideally have some sort of say. I mean, because you're talking about worrying about parking, but it's some of those are really significant use changes and uh, it's a little scary living next to somewhere that is supposed, we, we were told we were buying a house next to a college and, and it's, um, unsettling to know at any moment it might not be a college it might be something totally different and I yeah it, it puts us on edge it's a um, I don't know I we appreciate their presence we want their success but we also for things that could affect us 24 hours a day like we live here they get to go home and this is home so when something could affect us like that I would like to know that it's not going to be an administrative check mark for them guess that's that's it thank you thank you Aaron. thank you uh okay i have nolan langwell sorry Hi. to mispronounce that no one gets it right it's all good <laughs> uh so i'm nolan langwell i live at 17 kent street um i've lived in montpelier about 15 years um but i moved into my house now i bought my house six months before the pandemic um and I got to say that uh, this is a great neighborhood. And I was really thankful to have been in this neighborhood during the lockdown because I have the best neighbors. I love walking to the green and seeing everybody. Or so, I, and it's nice to actually see some new faces of people who I have not met. Um, 
so that said, like, I, I appreciate Katie's presentation and I, I support the college's application. Um, they've been a good neighbor. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've, I've also wondered how they survive with all the empty buildings. And I think we need to support their efforts to remain viable and to maintain, to be, to have revenue sources in which to maintain that campus that we all rely on and enjoy. Um, and I support the effort and it should, yeah. Um, I also think that I've also heard that just because it's moving from conditional to permitted doesn't mean that there isn't still gonna be a process. So I think that moving those things from conditional to permitted, there will still be a process for which us to have some say further and there still have to get permitting. Uh, and personally, I'd welcome the addition of many of the conditional uses. Um, for instance, I'd love to have a gym or a coffee shop or even a performance center, center nearby. I will also say that given the housing crisis in Vermont, we should have an open mind. There are a lot of people in the community who are unhoused. And I, for one, am open even if there was some kind of temporary housing um, for some of the unhoused. I know that's not a popular opinion, but I'd be open to that. Um, not that I have a say. Um, because it's the college's choice, and I would be open to them having that choice. Also, just given the housing crisis, um, in general, uh, uh, the idea of a multi-unit dwelling nearby would also, I'd also be supportive of that. So I would just say that I'm supportive of the application, and I appreciate um, you giving me the chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, Aaron, if you don't have anything more to say, if you could try to put your hand down on the, um, there you go, perfect. Um, Michael Sherman just put his hand up. Yes, I'm Michael Sherman. I live at 20 College Street, right across the street from Phyllis and down the street from uh, Aaron and, and Jose. Um, and I also support this petition. I think that if you looked at this list, you'll see that the college has at one time or another uh, done some of the things that are on it. Um, we, we, we have had, um, um, well, let's see, um, the, the farmer's market ran here for a while. Uh, admittedly, that was only on weekends, but it was a, a significant change in traffic patterns and who and how many people were on the street. Uh, the restaurant, well, the, the college has had dining service and did have a cafe for a while. We've done that. Um, performance theater, there's a lot of talk about in, 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 the, in the city for more performance spaces. And this is an opportunity to see if, if uh, a place which is uh, teaching uh, the fine arts, it includes performance, um, has an opportunity to present more of that for us in the city throughout. A movie theater, um, why not? If we can manage to get another movie theater um, in a time when people need to sort of get out, um, why not? I don't see a problem with that. Um, congregate living, temporary housing, group home, I agree with, with the previous speaker. We need, our state needs this, our city needs this. I think we need to be, be forward looking and welcome the possibilities of different kinds of people among us rather than shutting them out or at least um, if not shutting them out, making it so difficult that the pro projects don't go through. So I, I support this and I think that I taught at the college. Uh, I've lived next door to the college for over 30 years. Um, I remember when the college students were the problem because they made so much noise at night. Um, we managed to live with that, got through it. It's okay. No one was hurt by that. So I'm, I'm a supporter of this proposal. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Jenny Sheehan. It's actually my husband, Sean. Yeah. Oh, where we live. Sean. Uh, hello. Sean. Uh, and we live at uh, five five West Street, um, so the corner of corner of West and and First. Uh, appreciate um, seeing so many neighbors on here and hearing hearing people weigh in respectfully. I think it's been a great dialogue. I admit to being new to the to the process of of, um, of the conditional and the permitted and trying to come up to speed. Having just learned about it all in the last um, last few hours here, uh, but. Uh, 
I'll say on the on the a lot of the points, I think I certainly um, agree and respect a lot of what's been said. I think the college is a great great neighbors. We've lived in town here. It's almost 19 years, um, but like like Nolan, um, we lived on the other side of town until about two years ago, and he moved over, and we moved over about a month month later, stalking him. Um, <laughs> um, and and I think with the college, as, as everyone said too, with I mean the you know feeling a lot about the how how tight the housing market is, what we need to do for that, how much more housing we need to build in Montpelier. Looking back the last. 50 years of Montpelier's population, you know, shrinking and pushing um, all of the growth out into Berlin and all the surrounding towns. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with a lot of, I think Jose made some great points we are talking about, about the college, but I think it's possible to um, look at what the college is thinking or what anybody in town is going to be doing without thinking about the context of the last uh, 20 years and the, the reputation that, um, that, that Anthony and um, spoke about and Jocelyn spoke about there uh, as being an anti-growth town and knowing that all the efforts um, for for savings for parking garages for anything else that's come um, you know have have been pushed down and um, you know and continues to be um, pushing the, the sprawling sprawling growth out outside um, and so you know I think a lot of the is clear. I think what people are saying with the accepting of other people, I don't think it's overt, you know, racism or less than anybody's talking about. Um, but that's just the play of what happens in, in places throughout, throughout New England that tend to be more um, progressive and yet also tend to be very um, uh, segregated um, because of because of zoning zoning regulations. So I just wonder how much of that is the context at, at play, not not fully understanding yet, or having read everything with the conditional or the permitting or the long list or the vagueness. It's just the sense of wondering if the college is thinking if they are going to make a play or be able to to attract, um, you know, housing or the PUD or any any piece. Do they need to get more control, knowing? Um, that in the past when there has been more of a dialogue or has been a full process what that's meant is is no no development so that's more a, a question to me not expecting katie or anyone at the college to, to answer that certainly i'd love to have be involved um, and hear more as the, as the process goes on but in general i'm very supportive of the um of having more more housing in uh in vermont and and, and in montpelier and in this neighborhood and um and and then having the, the college utilize the space as much as they did. Thank you, Sean. Okay, let me scroll through in case we still have somebody here who's physically raising their hand and not. Anyone else in the room have any comments? Yes. Yeah. Okay, if you could come up to the stand up microphone. My name is Steve Schaff. I'm a 18 College Street. I'm sorry, how do you spell your last name? S-H-O-F-F. -F. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, uh, I, I respectfully hope that we think about this as a community um, and not make this about racism. I, I don't see that as a relevant concern. Um, I'm concerned as everybody about the homeless people, but I think we need to really think about how we can make things work and how to make them safe. One point I have is, the, the, the traffic up and down that road in the wintertime is horrific and dangerous. So the only concern I have is if we have a more traffic up there, there may be some real issues with accidents. Sometimes we have to call for the city to salt the road there on college. So I'm very concerned about what that would mean. Um, the other thing that I don't know if people realize is that that gets used uh, is a conduit when things get jammed up in Montpelier people go down that way so that's a real uh, real concern but I I would like to not be I'd like to feel okay to be resistive to some to be concerned as everyone else has without being labeled a racist because of those concerns so I'd like to put that out there thank you thank you Steve and I'm sorry was it 18 College Street yes okay great no All right, hold on. Let me. Yeah. I got. I've got two 
Two got, screens worth of people. So let me, let me double check. And a lot of people don't have their cameras on. Um, so there's a lot of people who don't have cameras on. So if there's somebody who doesn't have their camera on and wishes to speak, please just unmute and announce yourselves because I don't see any little Zoom hands and I don't see any physical hands. Oh, Jose just popped up. Hi, um, Jose again. Um, really quick, I mean, as, a, as an example, and I don't know how the neighborhood would feel about this, but you know, right now, um, there are Afghan refugees coming in, right? And obviously there's a shortage of housing. Well, you know, maybe if, if the college spelt out a very conditional use for that specific purpose, people would consider that, you know? But I think it comes down to communicating clearly what the intent is. And if the intent is just trying to plug in a financial hole, that's gonna be very difficult to do. But I think it's important for them to have a, you know, a clear purpose for each asset that they have, and then lay it out, and you know, uh, let the community uh, participate in the process. Because um, I think, as Aaron mentioned, you know, we live here, many of the people literally across the street, and many people who work there and who would not be impacted like we are. So we we clearly want to have a say. Uh, you know, it's part of the democratic process. And it's actually, they're asking for an exception, um, which is uh, something that the city has experienced with the college before. I'm not trying to, but it is, it is the history in the past where, where you ended up at the Supreme Court because they felt they were exempt of, of something, you know? So I think it's important that we let everybody participate. And by closing the door, by shifting the conditional to sort of permanent use is closing the door to our say and our input. And I think it's healthy to have community input. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, I do have another, somebody else wants to speak, Phyllis. I was wondering if I could yep. just add something. Yep, Please go see. ahead, Phyllis. I just- um... oh, Sorry, Elisa, I see you. Get to, just oh. give me a minute. No, uh, Phyllis fine. first and then Elisa. Got it. I... Uh, feel compelled to respond also to the uh, accusation that the neighbors who are opposed to this are being racist or not wanting uh, diversity in the neighborhood, because that's clearly not where I'm coming from. As a matter of fact, I had conversations with Rick uh, D'Agostino last, uh, I, I can't remember his last name, Rick from Good Samaritan last year. And I thought it was a very interesting project for the college. But what people, some people who have made those comments are ignoring the fact that one of the conditional uses that are, or several, two of the uses are to um, have a motel or to have a bed and breakfast. That is not going to create diversity in the community or do anything for housing. So that's why uh, it's my opinion that either the list has to be narrowed down or more preferably it all remain under conditional use. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, Elisa, I think you had, had something to say. You're gonna have to unmute yourself again though. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I'm trying to look for the reference in the long documents. Forgive me, I haven't found it, but I do want to just highlight something that I recall reading about the designation, and maybe you can help me with this, of sort of reserve space, uh, that it's not, it's sort of generally alluded to, but it's not marked where that would be in the plan, which I just want to say is a little concerning to me because it's it's so vague. So if so it's alluding to, let's say, the square footage that's in front of College Hall that's now used very generously um, given by the BCFA or allowed for the community to use. It's not clear in the plan whether that would be the specific reserve land that's held, you know, outside of any changes or development. And um, it would be nice if there was clarification on what that reserve land refers to specifically in the site plans. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. Yeah, that, that was a, a specific question that we did sort of want to get a general idea on. And have you identified, there's a 30% area to reserves open space. Have you identified where that might be or 
That's we something that obviously. Well, that's also something the board's going to have to figure out what is actually required based on the regs, because it's not really 100% clear on whether or okay. not they have to specify. Because, I mean, it's also if it was a campus and they sold off part of it, right? Yeah. What they'd have to require for that 30%, the 30% would shrink, right? It has to, there has to be some moldability to it. Right. Um, it's not, the regulations don't say a certain area has to be identified as that 30%, right? Right. But it could potentially, because it does use the word reserved, so there, there's a it's a it's a it's a gray area in the regs. Is there a different there's isn't there a different language on the open space and the other PUDs though? I think it's um, possible that the other we don't have to, we don't have to look PUDs it up right now. I'm just saying that like yet. <laughs> there's that is something to, for us it's, to it's something for to consider. Yeah, yeah, it's something um, that I need to research a little bit more and maybe talk to Mike Miller about. Yeah, and Katie I mean, and I need to as, I'll, I'll advise Katie on what. But clearly, it's a concern. As one member of the board, I mean, I would. It would make sense to have a site plan that identifies a specific area, you know, with uh, with open space. Um, that's just, you know, one member of the board's opinion. Um, but um, is there anyone else to comment up here? Phyllis has got her hand oh. up still. Phyllis, did you just not? There you go. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, hold um, on, I'm gonna scan through. So, given that it's 9 p.m. here, um, do you have any board members or anything to say? We were like to wrap things up a little bit katie did you have anything you would like to say There's a lot of public comment i'm sure and <laughs> no i again of. i appreciate everyone's time and everyone's comments um you know it is a really important piece of this community and i've worked there for over 20 years and i like everybody else wants to see it succeed and be a good neighbor so yeah. as i said earlier i feel like this is the beginning of a conversation and yeah. Um, I look forward to the next time that we're able to meet again. All right, thank you. Um, any board members have anything to add? I would just like to say thank you to everybody who spoke tonight. I thought that dialogue was meaningful and respectful and certainly folks gave me um, a lot to think about as, as part of the process. So I just wanna thank everybody for their comments tonight. Thank you. Um, so there's, cause it's a sketch plan. There's no formal decision that we make tonight. I think you've, You've gotten comments, uh, you know, there's certainly extra guidance um, for some other minor issues in the staff report and whatnot. And I'm sure the, like always, you'll be working with Meredith closely as your application, you know, develops and developing materials and whatnot. So um, I guess we wish you the, the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. And I will get you meeting minutes as soon as I can. That's part of the process. Um, the video will also be posted if for some reason you want to go back and listen to exact word for word stuff. Um, our, please give us a little grace period on the minutes. Our recording secretary is not available, so I'm doing those myself. Absolutely. I, Thank you. <laughs> can I ask one quick question, which is, if community members who weren't here tonight are able to participate, what is the best way for them to communicate their feelings about this topic? And when would that oh. be an official record? Okay, well, so, so, you know, there was no evidence tonight or anything, right? We'll take all this in and it'll be reflected in meeting minutes and get put in a file, the sketch plan file that goes in our planning department records. Um, the next hearing that would happen on this topic would be after VCFA files a final application. Um, and anybody who made comments tonight, um, anybody who, you know, would, would need to repeat any of those comments, although, you know, there's going to be a more thorough application. So the hope would be that they'd review that new application. Um, and hopefully a lot of their concerns would be addressed there. Um, but the, the, Next public hearing notice, if there is one, I'm assuming there will be, um, will be mailed out to all abutting property owners. Um, when that happens, we also post that information on our pending applications page. Um, and anybody can email me who wants 
more direct information on how to get there. Um, and then, of course, we also post the meeting agendas um, to the city website, the agenda and meeting minutes page. I think that the best anybody who has questions specifically on how to follow this should probably just email me um, or call the planning department. I guess um, I was wondering, you said something that we could subscribe. I mean, I'm adjoining a neighbor, so I'll receive something in the mail, but there yeah. are obviously people here who might not be immediate right. neighbors who, who want to know when the hearing is. Right. So the, the subscription to the posting of agendas, that's only going to get updated the week before the meeting, um, possibly as late as the Friday before the Monday meeting. Um, so it might be better just to, to periodically check the, there's a, another page in there called the pending applications for public hearings page. Um, and we post those within a day or two of mailing those public hearing notices, which go out, you know, three weeks or more sometimes before the hearing date. So you'll just get more time to look over the application. I guess I would also ask any community members who are adjoining neighbors and receive the mailing to share news of this hearing with their community so that, you know, as many people as possible in the neighborhood and the community have a chance to participate. Yeah, does, does College Street, does, does, I don't know which, do, do you guys have a CAN neighborhood network with somebody who's actually the coordinator? Yes. I mean, okay. And I did share information with that person. So, um, but that wouldn't be, I, I don't know that that includes the college it, or every part. Right. But, but if there are a couple of CAN contacts up there, we have been for some other applications, um, been agreeing to send that person an email. Mm -hmm. um, of when the public hearing notice goes out and then they can email it around to all of their people. We just, we can't. That's a great idea. Trying to, trying to keep track of, of everybody who wants something where we can't just pull it up on a map gets very, very difficult. Um, but going through that can, if you have you know, a spokesperson and the can neighborhood spokespeople are, and representatives are a really good example of that where it's formalized and we can keep track of them um they can email me and say hey we want to be on the list for when specifically bcfa files their final application for this pud um because we know it's gonna we know that's gonna happen pretty much because they need that to to do future development um and so it's a distinct item that's easier for us to track so that's a possibility all right so we should encourage our local can people to leaders to reach out to you and then what I'm hearing is you'll send them uh, a mailed uh, uh, email email announcement, yep. okay. an electronic announcement, a copy of what's mailed out to a butters. Okay, in a timely way, like more than two days before. You're talking about the three week before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, well, they'll get emailed the same day that we mail the physical notice. Okay. Well, I'll alert my local can person, and maybe people in the other neighborhoods can do that for theirs as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, that was a lot of administrative stuff. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, this, and by the way, Michael's on. At this time, I will entertain a motion. Actually, uh, do we got missing anything? Is there any no, new business? Just, no, just the, the next meeting is Monday, December 20th at 7 uh, p.m. Okay. And we do have applications. All righty. Thank you, Meredith. Is there a motion? No. So moved. To adjourn? To adjourn? <laughs> yeah. I figured that's what it's for. <laughs> All right. Catherine makes a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Joe, how do you vote? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Abby? Yes. And Michael? Yes. And Rob votes yes, that unanimously approves the motion to adjourn. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll hopefully see you in a, a month or so. Thank you. Or later. <laughs>